This is a legacy episode of the Lesbian Historic Motif podcast, originally released as part of the Lesbian Talk Show podcast group. Some references may be obsolete. The show looks at lesbian-relevant themes in history and literature, has interviews and discussions about current historical fiction with queer female characters, including fantastic versions of the past, and presents new original historical fiction for your enjoyment. I needed a breather from recording and editing new episodes this month, so I'm reprising a series of episodes on poetry about love between women. If you've been a podcast listener from the very beginning, I hope you enjoy them just as much as you did the first time. And if this is the first time you've heard these episodes, you have a real treat coming. There's an ulterior motive behind this podcast. A couple of them, actually. You see, I've discovered that I really like reciting old poetry as part of this podcast. And I think you like it too, because the shows that focus on poetry have been fairly popular, like the one looking at translations of Sappho's poetry, and the one about medieval love poetry. The second ulterior motive is that putting together an episode involving lots of poetry means I don't have to write as much. And when I'm feeling in a bit of a time crunch, that's a good thing. Although, as I found when putting this show together, just because a lot of the text comes from somewhere else doesn't mean it doesn't take a long time to prepare. But I thought I'd do a few episodes looking at poetry about love between women in various different eras. As usual, there's a bit of a European and an English language bias simply because of the sources I have easily available. Though I may do one specifically on Arabic poetry if I can find some complete texts in translation rather than just excerpts. And the non-English material will be in translation, which rather undermines the point of it being poetry. As a wise person once said in Italian, traditore, traditore. A translator is a traitor. Or in the decidedly misogynistic but more flowery version, a translation is like a mistress. If it is beautiful, it will not be faithful. And if it is faithful, it is probably ugly. But communication is as essential as beauty, so I'll try for a happy medium. I'll include the original versions of the non-English works in the transcript for you to read if you like. Today's show is about the poetry of the Renaissance and early modern period, for all practical purposes, the 16th and 17th centuries. The works are by both women and men. There is a tendency, though not an absolute rule, for the poems by women to be tender and devoted, while the poems by men are cynical and satirical. But there are some interesting exceptions. Rather than doing a strict chronology, I've grouped them into some general themes. I'm calling the first group The Pangs of Love. These are poems written by women about the sadder side of love or intimacy with other women. It might be jealousy or unfulfilled yearning or mourning for a lost love. We'll start out with 17th century English poet Catherine Phillips. There's an ongoing debate on whether Catherine Phillips can or should be considered a lesbian poet. She was a significant figure in the expression of Neoplatonic philosophy among women and founded a social circle called the Society of Friendship that embodied those ideals. Her poems are full of sentiments of intense love and devotion for her closest female friends, especially Anne Owen, who was referred to with the poetic nickname Lucasia, while Phillips used the name Orinda. Phillips created and promoted a community of women's passionate friendships. This was well before the official era of romantic friendship. But the traces of her intense same-sex relationships in her poetry also document her frustration with the social dynamics that made such friendships tenuous and often subordinated them to marriage. When her beloved Lucatia married, she wrote, I find, too, there are few friendships in the world marriage-proof, especially when the person our friend marries has not a soul particularly capable of the tenderness of that endearment. Such a temper is so rarely found that we may generally conclude the marriage of a friend to be the funeral of a friendship. The poem I've chosen is not one of the more familiar ones written to Lucasia, but one addressed to Mary Aubrey, who had a place in her heart before Lucasia came along. The verses speak of how love makes two beings seem a single person, and how such a love can be a shield against the world. Philip speaks of two souls, minds, and hearts becoming one. When she says, My breast is thy private cabinet. She isn't speaking of a type of closeting to hide their love away, but rather refers to a private, intimate space where they can express their true thoughts to each other. 
Strengthened by their love, they can ignore the troubles of the dull world and count themselves rich, a sentiment many can sympathize with today. To Mrs. M. Aubrey. Soul of my soul, my joy, my crown, my friend, a name which all the rest doth comprehend. How happy are we now, whose souls are grown by an incomparable mixture, one, whose well-acquainted minds are now so near as love or vows or friendship can endear. I have no thought but what's to thee revealed, nor thou desire that is from me concealed. Thy heart locks up my secrets richly set, and my breast is thy private cabinet. Thou shedst no tear but what my moisture lent, and if I sigh it is thy breath is spent. United thus, what horror can appear worthy our sorrow, anger, or our fear? Let the dull world alone to talk and fight, and with their vast ambitions nature fright. Let them despise so innocent a flame, while envy, pride, and faction play their game. But we, by love sublimed so high, shall rise to pity kings and conquerors despise. Since we, that sacred union, have engrossed, which they and all the factious world have lost. When I did an entire podcast episode about Afra Ben, the 17th century poet, playwright, and sometimes spy, I included several of her more popular works, especially the gender-bending To the Fair Clorinda, Who Made Love to Me, Imagined More Than Woman. Rather than repeating any of the poems I used before, here I offer a somewhat bittersweet verse in which Afra offers her heart to a woman who, well, alas, you'll find out in the end. Ben was a bit more forthright than Phillips in expressing her desire, and Ben wrote romantic poems addressed to both women and men, while Phillips' poem danced at the edge of being interpretable as an expression of intense friendship. Ben's offering is striking in its physicality. A Song While Iris, I at distance gaze and feed my greedy eyes, that wounded heart that dies for you, dull gazing can't suffice. Hope is the food of lovesick minds, on that alone twill feast. The nobler part which love refines no other can digest. In vain, to nice and charming maid, I did suppress my cares. In vain, my rising sighs I stayed and stopped my falling tears. The flood would swell, the tempest rise, as my despair came on, when from her lovely cruel eyes I found I was undone. Yet at your feet, while thus I lie and languish by your eyes, tis far more glorious here to die than gain another prize. Here let me sigh, here let me gaze, and wish at last to find, as raptured nights and tender days, as he to whom you're kind. Elizabeth Singer Rowe, like many 17th century poets, was fond of neoclassical imagery of nymphs and shepherds, as in the chosen selection here. She used the pen name Philomela for her first published collection at age 22. Much of her poetry was religious in nature, and she seems to have had an almost neo-Gothic preoccupation with death in her best-known collection, Letters from the Dead to the Living. In addition to a happy but tragically brief marriage to poet Thomas Rowe, she had an earlier friendship with publisher John Dunton that he at least considered romantic, though she called it platonic. The same sex sentiments expressed in her poem, Love and Friendship, don't seem to correspond to a romantic relationship in Rowe's own life, and the title gives us a hint that we may be intended to understand a categorical distinction between the love that Amaryllis expresses for her shepherd swain Alexis and the nobler warmth of friendship that Sylvia offers for Aminta. But Sylvia's sentiments are framed as an amorous secret and the simple act of setting a heterosexual and a same-sex relationship on an equal standing is meaningful. Take note of Sylvia's appeal to the, quote, chaste goddess of the groves, unquote, which is, of course, Diana, closely associated with the imagery of women's same-sex relationships at this time. Love and Friendship, a Pastoral. Amaryllis. While from the skies the ruddy sun descends and rising night the evening shade extends, while pearly dews o'erspread the fruitful field and closing flowers reviving odors yield, let us beneath these spreading trees recite what from our hearts our muses may indite. Nor need we in this close retirement fear lest any swain our amorous secrets hear. Sylvia 
To every shepherd I would mine proclaim, since fair Aminta is my softest theme. A stranger to the loose delights of love, my thoughts the nobler warmth of friendship prove. And while its pure and sacred fire I sing, chaste goddess of the groves, thy succor bring. Amaryllis. Propitious God of love, my breast inspire, with all thy charms, with all thy pleasing fire, propitious God of love, thy succor bring, whilst I, thy darling, thy Alexis, sing. Alexis, as the opening blossoms fair, lovely as light and soft as yielding air, for him each virgin sighs, and on the plains the happy youth above each rival reigns. Nor to the echoing groves and whispering spring, in sweeter strains does artful Conan sing, when loud applauses fill the crowded groves, and Phoebus the superior song approves. Sylvia. Beauteous Aminta is as early light, breaking the melancholy shades of night. When she is near, all anxious trouble flies, and our reviving hearts confess her eyes. Young love and blooming joy and gay desires in every breast the beauteous nymph inspires. And on the plain, when she no more appears, the plain a dark and gloomy prospect wears. In vain the streams roll on, the eastern breeze, and to the silent night their notes prolong. Nor groves, nor crystal streams, nor verdant field does wanton pleasure in her absence yield. Amaryllis. And in his absence, all the pensive day, in some obscure retreat, I lonely stray all day to the repeating caves, complain in mournful accents and a dying strain. Dear lovely youth, I cry to all around. Dear lovely youth, the flattering veils resound. Sylvia. On flowery banks, by every murmuring stream, Aminta is my muse's softest theme. Tis she that does my artful notes refine. With fair Aminta's name, my noblest verse shall shine. Amaryllis. I'll twine fresh garlands for Alexis' brows, and consecrate to him eternal vows. The charming youth shall my Apollo prove. He shall adorn my songs and tune my voice to love. With Jane Barker's on the death of my dear friend and playfellow, we are offered the pains of love experienced and then lost. Like the other poets in this group, Barker was forthright in taking feminist stands and arguing for the rights of women, though the poets collected here are otherwise quite diverse in their politics. Barker's writings were typically aimed at a female audience, as with her structurally innovative work, A Patchwork Screen for Ladies, which combines romance, poetry, recipes, hymns, and philosophy. She did not marry and express disinterest in men, while including homoerotic themes in her writing. We can see that in this presumably autobiographical reminiscence on the death of a close female friend written in 1688. Because it comes up in multiple poems of this era, I thought I'd note that the reference to a turtle means a turtle dove, a common symbol of romantic love and courtship, and is not a reference to a hard-shelled aquatic reptile. Another now obscure allusion is to Heraclitus, a classical Greek philosopher nicknamed the Weeping Philosopher for his generally gloomy take on life. On the death of my dear friend and playfellow. I dreamed I lost a pearl, and so it proved. I lost a friend much above pearls beloved. A pearl perhaps adorns some outward part, but friendship decks each corner of the heart. Friendship's a gem whose luster does outshine all that's below the heavenly crystalline. Friendship is that mysterious thing alone which can unite and make two hearts but one. It purifies our love and makes it flow at the clearest stream that's found in love below. It sublimates the soul and makes it move towards perfection and celestial love. We had no by designs, nor hoped to get each by the other place among the great, nor riches hoped, nor poverty we feared. T'was innocence in both, which both revered. Witness this truth, the Willstorp fields, where we so oft enjoyed a harmless luxury, where we indulged our easy appetites with pocket apples, plums, and such delights, that we contrived to spend the rest of the day in making chaplets or checkstone play. When weary, we ourselves supinely laid on beds of violets under some cool shade, where the sun in vain strove to dart through his rays, whilst birds around us chanted forth their lays. Even those we had bereaved of their young would greet us with a querimonious song. Stay here, my muse, and of these let us learn the loss of our deceased friend to mourn. 
Learn, did I say? Alas, that cannot be. We can teach the clouds to weep and winds to sigh at sea, teach brooks to murmur, rivers to overflow. We can add solitude to the shades of you, where turtles to be witness of our moan, they'd in compassion quite forget their own. Nor shall hereafter Heraclitus be famed for his tears, but to my muse and me fate shall give all that fame can comprehend. Ah, poor repair for the loss of such a friend. One of the clues we have that love between women was beginning to be taken seriously in the 16th and 17th centuries is that men were writing about it, and especially when men began to express jealousy about women's devotion to each other. But in this first poem by French poet Pontus de Tiard, we see an older motif, that of a woman unhappy that the love she feels for another woman is in vain and, by its nature, cannot be achieved. This was a common trope in versions of the classical story of Iphis and Ianthe, but by the Renaissance, women were beginning to contradict that position. Perhaps writers like Pontus needed to reassure themselves that men weren't being made obsolete. Like another poem I include in this episode, this one makes a direct connection between the female pair and historical pairs of famous male devoted friends who often featured at this time in discussions of Neoplatonic friendships between men that had homoerotic elements. The original poem is in French and is included in the transcript. The translation I use is from Terry Castle's The Literature of Lesbianism and has aimed for a more literal and vernacular style rather than being strictly metrical or aiming for the feel of 16th century English poetry. Elegy for a lady enamored of another lady. I have ever fixed love and honor's bright part as the only two ardors that burn in my heart. Could such a magnificent flame ignite that no brighter soul could ever alight? But I knew not how to envision in thought how the two fires at once could be wrought. For as much as beauty is the stuff of love, and in honor entire lies beauty entire, I could not see how this very beauty could be part of both love and integrity. Thus I spake, my beauty in honor within myself doth lie, but not that beauty to myself of value would be naught but mine own honor true. Yet the lover outside the self must not rest, but seek the beauty afforded love through conquest. Thus only honor's heat will exist in me. Must I thus flee the ardor of the other deity? Alas, love's beauty, would I choose you over men? Ah, no, I know too well this century we are in. Man loves beauty, and honor doth mock, not cherish. When beauty pleases him, honor doth perish. So, as of one honor alone, dearly curious and free, I disdained all flames amorous when love by my freedom took offense and handed me a decoy immune to my defense. It enriches the mind, the mouth it refines, it sweetens your speech, in your eye it reclines, in your hair it weaves a knot that fain does amaze, that binds me to you, it fans a blaze. Alas, who will believe with such new heat that my heart, a woman's, alas, for another woman beats? Never more softly love did cruise into another heart, with honor unbruised, retaining there its untarnished beauty, the lover enjoying this beloved beauty in the same subject, O oh, felicity above, if lightly had it pleased you not lightly to love. But cruelest love, having wounded me, bereft, dislodged all within me and emptiness left, emptied of love, no affectionate fashioned while filling my heart with miserable passion, and by fair spite I just cry out my plea, You're an ingrate, and your freedom mocks me. Where is your pledged troth, the oaths you did lend, where from your speeches are the words that pretend, like a python that faints and attracts, that knew how to chain me by ear to those pacts? Alas! How I've spilled my guts in vain, how I fled every other love the same, how in vain you, scornful one I chose, as my one delight, as my life's rose. How in vain did I think the time ahead would by miracle through the centuries us wed, and that, unique example in French history, our love would serve as eternal memory, proof that love of woman by woman may arise, and from all manly lovers seize the prize. A Damon for Pythias, an Aeneas for Achates, a Hercules for Nestor, Chariphon for Socrates. Hopius for Diamantus have shown us yet that love of man for man is wholly met. 
If love of man for woman does proof so abound, there is no need for me to cast around, but of woman for woman there is not yet in the empire of love a trove so richly set, and it cannot be found as your flight bespeaks. Since to my faith your in return was weak, for never beneath the sun was greater purity, nor hotter heat in fire, nor sweeter lick in honey, no greater bounty found in all of nature than in my heart, where love had come for nurture. But harder than the rock Gibraltar is your heart's rule, more even than a barbarous Scythian is it cruel, and Ursa Major has seen less ice eternal than you have in your veins, nor does nocturnal Morpheus's shifting visage alter its line as much as thought transforms in your inconstant mind. Alas, how spite does from me mine own self remove. Open up to love, ingrate, open up to love. Suffer that the sweet barb that pierced our heart might once more enter yours, too much unhurt. Seek out in your speech the affection it once drove, and retie the sweet knot in which was wove the common bond that you to me once led, and let our hands rejoin in vows we pled, the vow that in my spirit is secure, that even in death will endure. But if a new love enfold you in its fire, I implore counter-love on Teros, a god so dire, that before the pain within my heart immure I be transformed, achieving one thing more than what I was before, to wit, that my voice alone despondent endure when through this wood I roam, where in a little time my weeping pain would flow in a river or shower from a fountain, while I tell both stag and buck be horned alone in tufted woods, ingrate of your scorn, that you might of a subject all unworthy be subsumed, to pine forlornly, languish, and in your love be doomed. Edmund Waller's poem on the friendship betwixt two ladies shows a bit of unease about whether such a close relationship might interfere with the natural order of things. Women, after all, must be available to men. Waller was a 17th century English poet and politician, being active on the royalist side of the English Civil War. Much of his verse, like this one, is of a relatively simple structure, rather than following formal conventions packed with classical allusions. Many of his occasional poems referred to people in his social circle, and we can probably assume that the two ladies of this poem were inspired by people he knew, but I haven't been able to track down any guesses of their identities. Waller uses several interesting metaphors, such as comparing a woman's love to a debt that she presumably owns to some generic man, and that loving another woman is like a debtor giving away his money so that he can avoid paying the debt. The reference to the boy's eluded darts is, of course, to Cupid's arrows. And Cytherea is another name for Venus, who was said to travel in a chariot drawn by doves. On the friendship betwixt two ladies. Tell me, lovely, loving pair, why so kind and so severe? Why so careless of our care, only to yourselves so dear? By this cunning change of hearts, you the power of love control, while the boy's eluded darts can arrive at neither soul. For in vain to either breast still beguiled love does come, where he finds a foreign guest neither of your hearts at home. Debtors, thus with like design, when they never mean to pay, that they may the law decline to some friend make all away. Not the silver doves that fly yoked in Cytherea's car, not the wings that lift so high and convey her son so far, are so lovely, sweet, and fair, or do more ennoble love, are so choicely matched a pair, or with more consent do move. Denis Sanguine de saint Pavan was a bit more waspish in his jealousy for women's mutual affections. He was a French libertine, famed for his lascivious poetry, and later nicknamed the King of Sodom for his bisexuality. Although the 17th century libertines gave the impression of supporting free love, it often came in a predatory, misogynistic flavor. His poem, Two Beauties, Tender Lovers, was not published until two centuries after his death, no doubt due to the subject matter. As with Waller's poem previously, St. Pavan presents love between women as vain and pointless, Women, he claims, cannot satisfy each other, being too similar, so there's no benefit to denying themselves to men. Two Beauties, Tender Lovers Two beauties, tender lovers, one attends the other equally, equally wounded by the same affliction, suffering equally. Uncomplaining in their torment, 
both ceaselessly do sigh. Now the one lover is mistress, now the mistress is lover. Whatever they do for pleasure, their hearts are not content, wasting thus their daily treasure. These innocents, in self-abuse, seeking pointlessly in their loving pleasures which to us they do refuse. If you think that men appropriating the language of lesbianism is a modern invention, that whole annoying thing about, oh, I'm a lesbian trapped in a man's body because I love women too, rest assured that 16th century dudes were just as annoying. Poetry, after all, was thought to be a manly art, so even the famous Sappho was considered the literary property of men. The following poetic exchange between John Donne and his friend Thomas Woodward is fascinating because not only does it frame Sappho's love for women in a positive way, but because of how it appropriates that imagery for themselves. Although Donne wrote a fair amount of sensual poetry, probably his most famous work is the meditation that concludes, any man's death diminishes me, for I am involved with mankind. Therefore do not send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Dunn's poem, Sappho to Philinus, written in 1633, imagines the ancient poet lamenting that her poetry has failed to secure the heart of her beloved. The poem includes a number of references to Sappho's poem, He Seems Like a God to Me, but also makes the argument for the greater desirability of same-sex love for women in that it creates no risk of pregnancy. To this end, Dunn uses some rather colorful agricultural metaphors. I'm not sure that I'd risk calling my beloved, quote, a natural paradise, unmanured, unquote. Another theme is that love between women is natural because the touch of two women's bodies is like a body touching itself. This is one of the themes common in this era that simultaneously supports and undermines same-sex love, that a woman loving another woman is like a woman loving herself. Sappho to Philinus. Where is that holy fire which verse is said to have? Is that enchanting force decayed? Verse that draws nature's works from nature's law? Thee, her best work, to her work cannot draw. Have my tears quenched my old poetic fire? Why quenched they not as well that of desire? Thoughts, my mind's creatures, often are with thee, but I, their maker, want their liberty. Only thine image in my heart doth sit, but that is wax and fires environ it. My fires have driven, thine have drawn it hence, and I am robbed of picture, heart, and sense. Dwells with me still mine irksome memory, which both to keep and lose grieves equally. That tells me how fair thou art, Thou art so fair as gods, when gods to thee I do compare, are graced thereby, and to make blind men see what things gods are, I say they're like to thee. For if we justly call each silly man a little world, what shall we call thee then? Thou art not soft, and clear, and straight, and fair, as down as stars, as cedars, and lilies are, but thy right hand, and cheek, and eye only, are like thy other hand, and cheek, and eye. Such was my fail a while, but shall be never, as thou wast, art, and oh, mayst thou be ever, here lovers swear in their idolatry that I am such, but grief discolors me, and yet I grieve the less, lest grief remove my beauty and make me unworthy of thy love. Plays some soft boy with thee? Oh, there wants yet a mutual feeling which should sweeten it. His chin, a thorny, hairy unevenness, doth threaten, and some daily change possess. Thy body is a natural paradise, in whose self, unmanured, all pleasures lie. Nor needs perfection, why shouldst thou then admit the tillage of a harsh, rough man? Men leave behind them that which their sin shows, and are as thieves traced, which rob when it snows. But of our dalliance no more signs there are than fishes leave in streams, or birds in air. And between us all sweetness may be had, all, all that nature yields, or art can add. My two lips, eyes, thighs, differ from thy two, but so, as thine from one another do. And oh, no more the likeness being such, why should they not alike in all parts touch? Hand to strange hand, lip to lip none denies, why should they, breast to breast, or thighs to thighs? Likeness begets such strange self-flattery, that touching myself, all seems done to thee. Myself I embrace. In mine own hands I kiss, and amorously thank myself for this. Me in my glass I call thee. But alas, when I would kiss, tears dim mine eyes and glass. O oh, cure this loving madness, 
and restore me to thee, thee my half, my all, my more. So may thy cheeks red outwear a scarlet dye, and their white, whiteness of the galaxy. So may thy mighty, amazing beauty move, envy in all women, and in all men love, and so be change in sickness far from thee, and thou, by coming near, keep'st them from me. The attribution of the next poem to John Donne's friend Thomas Woodward is in part conjectural. The poem appears in a 1620 collection of Donne's work with the heading To Mr. J. D. by T. W. Scholars are fairly certain of the attribution to Woodward. Donne and Woodward were certainly close friends. There are suggestions that there may have been an erotic aspect to their friendship. The imagery in this poem is clearly intended as a response to that in the previous though in a decidedly less elevated vein. Woodward envisions the two female figures as their respective muses, engaged in mystic tributary, resulting in an orgasm, spending her pith, that is, this poem. The classical reference, Boss's adultery, no fruit did leave, refers to the classical Roman writer Martial's riddle about how a woman named Bassa could commit adultery with no man present. To Mr. J.D., by T. W. Thou sends me prose and rhymes, I send for those lines which, being neither, seem or verse or prose. They're lame and harsh and have no heat at all, but what thy liberal beams on them let fall. The nimble fire which in thy brains doth dwell, is it the fire of heaven or that of hell? It doth beget and comfort like heaven's eye, and like hell's fire it burns eternally. And those whom in thy fury and judgment thy verse shall scourge like hell, it will torment, have mercy on me and my sinful muse, which, rubbed and tickled with thine, could not choose, but spend some of her pith, and yield to be one in that chaste and mystic tributary. Bass's adultery no fruit did leave, nor theirs, which their swollen thighs did nimbly weave, and with new arms and mouths embrace and kiss, though they had issue, was not like to this. They muse, O strange and holy lechery, being a maid still, got this song on me. Of course, the ribald and teasing imagery of Woodward's verse is only one small step from satire and vituperation aimed at actual women. The accusation of lesbianism has long been a staple of men's attempts to control women's entrance into realms they considered exclusively male. As I noted above, in the Renaissance, men overtly claimed that poetry was a quintessentially masculine art. One of the reasons for male fascination with the figure of Sappho was to identify ways to masculinize her, or to appropriate her work in order to remove her apparent exception to this claim. English poet and playwright Ben Jonson considered the poetic career of courtier Cecilia Bulstrode to be almost a personal affront perhaps because he thought Bulstrode's patroness, the Countess of Bedford, should have patronized his work instead, but also because, as he implies in his opening salvo, that she dared to criticize him. His venom took the form, in 1640, of suggesting rather crudely that she had homoerotic tendencies, implying that her poetry could only result from raping her poetic muse. There's no evidence that Cecilia Bulstrode had any more pointed interest in women than usual. In fact, another contemporary who satirized her did so after jilting her after she pursued him romantically. But it scarcely matters in what direction Bulstrode's desires lay. For men, it was enough that she dared to rival them and must be torn down. And one of the easiest ways to do so was to frame her as mannish and perverse. In the first line of the poem, people may be familiar with the French word pucelle as being an epithet of the medieval heroine Joan of Arc, known as la pucelle, or the maiden but by the 17th century it had picked up a derogatory sense, and probably it was a fancy way of saying whore. But Johnson didn't restrict himself to sexual insults. He, he accuses her of vanity, then turns around and suggests she feigns too much piety, that she loves fine clothes, yet is ugly, and that no man would want her. I confess, the more he goes on, the more I'm cheering for Cecilia. Epigram on Cecilia Bulstrode. Does the court pucelle then so censure me, and thinks I dare not her? Let the world see what though her chamber be the very pit where fight the prime cocks of the game for wit, as that as any are struck, her breath creates new in their stead out of the candidates. What, 
though with tribid lust she force amuse, and in an epicene fury can write news equal with that which for the best news goes, as airy, light, and as like wit as those. What though she talk, and can at once with them make state, religion, bawdry, all the theme, and as lip thirsty in each word's expense, doth labor with the phrase more than the sense. What though she ride two mile on holidays to church, as others do to feasts and plays, to show their tires, to view and to be viewed. What though she be with velvet gown endued, and spangled petticoats brought forth to eye, as new rewards of her old secrecy. What though she hath won on trust, as many do, and that her truster fears her, must I do? I never stood for any place. My wit thinks itself not, though she should value it. I am no statesman, and much less divine, for Baudry tis her language, and not mine. Furthest I am from the idolatry to stuffs and laces, those my man can buy. And trust her I would least that hath forswore in contract twice. What can she perjure more? Indeed, her dressing some man might delight, her face there's none can like by candlelight. Not he that should the body have, for case to his poor instrument, now out of grace. Shall I advise thee, Pussel? Steal away from court, while yet thy fame hath some small day. The wits will leave you, if they once perceive you cling to lords, and lords, if you them leave for sermoners, of which now one, now other, they say you weakly invite with fits of the mother, and practice for a miracle. Take heed. This age would lend no faith to Darrell's deed, or if it would, the court is the worst place, both for the mothers and the babes of grace. For there the wicked in the chair of scorn will call it a bastard when a prophet's born. The French poet, François de Menard, was even more forthright in what he accused his subjects of, though he had the courtesy, or perhaps the sense, to cloak them in pastoral nicknames. De Menard was a contemporary of the French courtier Brantome, who wrote very explicitly of the homoerotic exploits of the women of the French court. Here, writing in 1646, he makes the intent of his verse plain in titling it Tribeds, or Lesbians. The translation, taken from Terry Castle's L The Literature of Lesbianism, uses modern slang to match the sense and tone of the original. It keeps the rhyme scheme, but doesn't attempt to match the meter. Tribids, or Lesbia Your gorgeous eyes are sorely wrecked, and migraines not the wind that's bitten, but rather Clemena's fierce delect, and your fingers, better fitting in an open fly than a glove or mitten. If your finger could shoot its wad with all it knows to do to date, sweet Phyllis, there's no debate that readily it could masquerade for something much too crude to name. To have, as is your pride, a hand so white and clean, how in hell do you keep it preened when the tub in which you slide? It has such strange soap, I mean. 17th century England saw a great deal of anxiety and debate on the proper distinction of the genders and the disaster that would come from men appropriating feminine tastes and women claiming masculine prerogatives. This played out in religious polemics, on the stage, and in popular verse. The following are two anonymous linked broadside ballads published in 1698, verging on the pornographic in tone, that form a satirical dialogue. The first is entitled the women's complaint to Venus, purporting to be the voice of English women, complaining that the men were all turned into sodomites. Though there were also several political jabs included, such as the quite accurate suggestion that King Charles II was prone to ennobling his mistresses. Women's complaint to Venus. How happy were good English faces till Monsieur from France taught Pego a dance to the tune of old Sodom's embraces. But now we are quite out of fashion. Poor whores may be nuns, since men turn their guns and vent on each other their passion. In the reign of good Charles the Second, full many a jade, a lady was made, and the issue right noble was reckoned. But now we find to our sorrow, we are overrun by sparks of the bum and peers of the land of Gomorrah. The bows to whom most we relied on, at night, make a punk of him that's first drunk, though unfit for the sport is John Dryden. The soldiers whom next we put trust in, no widow can tame or virgin reclaim, but at the wrong place will be thrust in. Fair Venus, thou goddess of beauty, receive our complaint, make Ribby recant, and the soldiers henceforth do their duty. The second broadside offers Venus's reply. 
retorting that the women brought this all on themselves by preferring lesbian sex, using possibly the earliest known use of the slang phrase, the game of flats. In fact, this broadside is quite educational with all of its synonyms for fucking. Tup. Swinge. The ballad also mentions green sickness, which was thought to be an illness suffered by women who weren't getting enough sex. Venus's reply. Why nymphs these pitiful stories? But you are to blame and have got a new game called flats with a swinging clitoris. Besides, I have heard of wax tapers with which you get up and each other tup to cure the green sickness and vapors. I am told by a delicate signors, some matrons do ease their lust, and so please they've not been laid within these ten years. Your frogmore frolics discover some reasons of art, so play the man's part you are for no masculine lover. At all which I am so offended, my son at men's hearts will throw no more darts till your lust and your lives are amended. Forsake but these odd ways of sinning, and I'll undertake the errantest rake shall swinge you as at the beginning. I've saved the most positive and most lyrical poems for last in a group I call The Triumph of Love. These poems are all written by women and addressed to the women they loved in a myriad of ways. It includes romantic love, near worshipful devotion, and simply reveling in the excellence of one's beloved. The poems are in Scots, Spanish, and French, all providing evidence of the emotions we lose when women's voices are suppressed in the historic record. The first is anonymous, and the female authorship is attributed largely on the basis of the viewpoint and treatment of the subject, as well as the female persona of the poem's voice. It comes from a collection called the Maitland Quarto Manuscript, dating to the 16th century, that is a major source of Scots literature of that era. By Scots, this means neither Scottish Gaelic nor English with a Scottish accent, but the close relative of English that developed along its own path in Scotland. If you've ever read the poetry of Robert Burns, you've encountered the Scots language. The verse can be rendered fairly closely in English by tweaking a handful of words, but the rhymes are sometimes impaired. The adaptation to English is my own work. There are a lot of classical and biblical references in this piece. Rather than listing them all, I'll just note that if you hear two names being mentioned together, they're either famous lovers or famous male platonic friends. The poem is innovative in claiming for a female couple the right to be set beside those well-known pairs. Maitland Quarto Manuscript, poem number 49. As Phoebus in his sphere's height excels the Cape Crepusculine, and Phoebe, all the stars light, your splendor, so Madame I ween, does only pass all feminine in sapience superlative, endowed with virtues so divine as learned Pallas does revive. And as by hidden virtue unknown the adamant draws iron there till, your courteous nature so has drawn my heart, yours to continue still, so great joy does my spirit fulfill, contemplate your perfection, and wield me wholly at your will, and ravish my affection. Your peerless virtue does provoke, and loving kindness does so move my mind to friendship's reciproque, that truth shall try so far above, the ancient heroic's love as shall be thought prodigious, and plain experience shall prove more holy and religious. In amity, Pirithus to Theseus had not such trust, nor to Achilles, Patroclus, nor Polides to true Orest, nor yet Achates' love so least to good Aeneas, nor such friendship David to Jonathan professed, nor Titus true to kind Yosip. Nor yet Penelope, I wist, so loved Ulysses in her days, nor Ruth, the kind of Moabitus, Nehemia, as the scripture says, nor Portia, whose worthy praise in Roman histories we read, who did devour the fiery blaze to follow Brutus to the dead. Would mighty Jove give me the hap with you to have your Brutus part, and metamorphosing our shape my sex into his will convert? No Brutus, then, should cause us smart, as we do now, unhappy women. Then should we both with joyful heart honor and bless the band of Hymen. Yea, certainly we should efface Pollux and Castor's memory. And if that they deserved place among the stars for loyalty, then our more perfect amity, more worthy recompense, should merit in heaven eternal deity among the gods to inherit. And as we are, 
though to our woe, nature and fortune do conjure, and hymen also be our foe, yet love of virtue does procure friendship and amity so sure, with so great fervency and force, so constantly we shall endure, that naught but death shall us divorce. And though adversity us vex, yet be our friendship shall be seen, there is more constancy in our sex than ever among men has been. No trouble, torment, grief, or pain, nor earthly thing shall us dissever, since constancy shall us maintain in perfect amity forever. Sister Juana Inés de la Cruz was no ordinary nun of the Order of St. Jerome. She had one of the largest private libraries in 17th century Mexico, with 4,000 volumes, and pursued scientific experiments as well as writing poetry. De la Cruz wrote romantic poetry primarily to two women who were both friends and powerful patronesses, and to whom she gave poetic nicknames in her work. Leonor Coreto, the Marquise de Mancera, wife of the Viceroy of Mexico, was addressed as Laura in de la Cruz's love poems. Sometime after Laura's death, de la Cruz began writing poems to Lissi, her nickname for Luisa Manrique de Lara y Gonzaga, the Marquise de la Laguna and Countess of Paredes who arranged for a volume of de la Cruz's poetry to be published in Spain. The poems invoked themes of both the courtly love tradition of the past and the romantic friendship tradition of the future, fitting comfortably into a celebration of platonic same-sex friendship used by both women and men in expressing loves that would be less acceptable if interpreted as carnal. The poem I've chosen is addressed to Lissy, her second love. My Divine Lissy to the Marquise de la Laguna Divine one, my Lissy, forgive me if I dare to call you mine, though I do not merit to be called yours. I believe it is not presumption to address you thus, for you are so radiant that my daring could not dim you. It is merely the tongue that misspeaks when one states that the master's empire, his very domain, belongs to the slave. My king, says the vassal, my jail, says the prisoner, and the humblest of slaves calls his master his without offense. So, when I call you mine, I have no pretense that all will think you are mine. It means only that I want to be yours. I saw you, but that is enough. In discoursing of fires, it is enough to point to the cause, without dwelling on the blame of the effect. To see you so distant does not deter my daring. No deity is secure from the arrogant flight of the mind. And though there may be others more deserving, the most humble valley and the loftiest mountain are equidistant from heaven. Finally, I plead guilty of adoring you. If you wish to punish me, that punishment will be my reward. Anne de Rouhan Chabot was a French noblewoman of the 17th century. Although the poem On a Lady Named Beloved, written in 1617, clearly expresses her romantic love for a woman, distinguishing what she feels from friendship and invoking Cupid as a clear signifier of erotic feelings, like many other 17th century women who wrote similar poetry, her interest leaned toward both men and women. She was, for a time, the mistress of King Louis XIV, and she was famous for her devotion to her much older husband. I don't think we know who the woman is who inspired this tender poem. Anne was highly educated, and we can see echoes of Sappho's poetry in the repeated phrase about someone being like a god. The known works of Sappho had been published in French by her time. On a Lady Named Beloved Beauty, it would be a great wrong if for your worthy graces I had been dealt the lover's fate for anyone but you, my dear beloved. All the Olympic torches illuminated in their course are not lovelier ornaments than the eyes of my beautiful beloved. Cupid, delighted with those eyes, his right hand armed with an arrow, shot into my troubled heart the ardent desire to love my beloved. I know not whether they be heavens or gods whose power for me is hidden and compels me, both near and far, to die so as to love my beloved. To see them, they seem like the heavens, of azure color are they, but by their effects they're like gods, forcing me yet to love that beloved. For me, then, they're both heavens and gods, because of their hidden power and luminous appearance, for I hold nothing dearer than my beloved. And that seems a good note to end on. We have seen the wide variety of interpretations and presentations of love between women in European poetry of the 16th and 17th centuries. That diversity reminds us that people in history never had a single understanding or opinion about same-sex love. 
The condemnation existed side by side with the celebration, the scorn with the praise. And more than anything, the poems by women remind us of all the voices that were silenced and suppressed, whose thoughts we can only imagine. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Lesbian Historic Motif podcast. See the show notes for links to people and topics. Most shows will have a transcript linked as well. If you have a book announcement, a topic suggestion, or might like to appear on the show, please drop me an email. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate it and subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and consider supporting our Patreon 